After heading west, we reached the final destination of our exploration of the lost places of Scotland. Last episode, we followed the trail of a forgotten tale of a murderous blood feud that destroyed many families. The final chapter and ultimate fruit of this tale of revenge and bloodshed is the massive abandoned mansion looming dark and empty before you. The hauntingly abandoned mansion built for revenge. The derelict place we explore today is in fact a sister house to one of the most famous and elegant mansions currently existing in the United Kingdom, but its story has followed a far different trajectory. Today it sits looking out over the derelict estates and overgrown lands of the Kennedy clan of Scotland. Our tale began last episode in the older family mansion of the Kennedys, the full story and exploration of which is in the link above. The Kennedys were an ancient clan who gained lands in the region of Galloway, Scotland in the Middle Ages. Over time the clan split into different noble families with the same Kennedy surname, with one main branch becoming the Lairds of Gervinmains and settling here by building a castle. During the 1600s, the Kennedy clan was embroiled in a feud that pitted different branches of the family against each other, eventually engulfing the area and much of Scotland in a long and bloody conflict. In the feud, the Laird of Gervinmains fought on the side of the Laird of Bargany against the cruel and greedy Gilbert and his son John, the Earl of Cassillis, who were widely known for torturing priests, forging documents in order to gain church lands, and for the summary hanging of many innocents. In the following decades, the Earl attacked and murdered Laird Bargany and would attempt to seize the lands of the Gervinmains family as well. In an act of revenge, the Earl's main ally and uncle, Sir Thomas of Colain, was assassinated near Greenan Castle by Bargany's widow and her remaining allies. As a result, many of the faction's leaders were ruined, being exiled, losing their lands, or were tortured and executed. Somehow, through it all, the Laird of Gervinmain survived, with the Earl perhaps dying before he could carry out any further revenge upon his family. In 1679, the old Gervinmain's castle was updated into a mansion, but they sadly soon went bankrupt, and by 1700, they'd sold it off to a Kennedy family branch called the Kirkhills, who had supported them in the feud. The Kirkhills then, just a hundred years later, would almost inexplicably abandon the rebuilt mansion in favor of an entirely new, much larger mansion. It was the new heir, Thomas, pictured in this portrait, who was the rector of the University of Glasgow, who would initiate this sudden move. He had conveniently married Jane Adam, the niece of the most famous architect in Scotland, Robert Adam. Adam was a man known internationally for his creations which stemmed from studies of classical architecture and helped to usher in the neoclassical style. He also served as official architect of the king's works. In 1781, just two years after marrying Jane, Thomas would commission Adam to construct the massive mansion we explore today which now lies almost next door to the also abandoned old family house. Adam was known for building fake ruins or building next to existing ones to use them as romantic backdrops for his new mansions. For this very reason, the old family house was then abandoned in 1790 and allowed to rot away. In 1782, Adam visited the site and drew this series of sketches of the new mansion, which were finalized in 1785. The new mansion would have four floors, with three public rooms, a smoke room, a library, business room, nurseries, school room, 17 bedrooms, 12 bathrooms, kitchens, and other servant-related rooms, all of which sat on 1,300 acres of land, with a two-acre garden with its own houses, a garage, dairy farm, coal mine, and stables. But there was something uncanny about all of this. Since 1776, Adam had also been working nearby on building the now famous Colleen Castle for David, the 10th Earl of Cassillis, the descendant of the same Earl that Thomas's ancestors had bloodily feuded with over a hundred years before. Adam was overwhelmed with work at the time and likely only took the project in 1781 due to Thomas now being part of his family. A further clue to Thomas's motivation also lies in a subtle detail in the backdrop of this portrait, made shortly after the new mansion's building. Greenan Castle, the location of the feud's famous assassination of the Earl's friend and uncle, Sir Thomas of Colain, by Thomas Kennedy's ancestors. Following this trend too, not surprisingly, many of the new mansion's main features, designed by Adam, mimicked the plans of the ongoing project at Colain. From its very outside appearance to the large round entrance tower with drawing room and library, 
to the huge spiral stair at the center with a huge circular skylight, the end result was eerily similar to the Earl's own plans. Work on the new mansion was completed in 1790 and on Colleen Castle shortly after in 1792. Adam died that very same year from a burst ulcer, leaving both mansions as his last and greatest works of his castle mansion style. Strangely too, in that same year, the Earl of Cassillis passed away without heirs, leaving his new estate to a distant relative in New York, who died a mere two years later. Under Thomas, the construction on the inside of the house was to continue feverishly for another two decades, until his death in 1819, with the completed mansion passing to his son Thomas. Thomas had been alienated from his father due to his divorce of his mother Jane in 1808, shortly after the mansion's interior was finished. With father and son no longer on speaking terms, he instead found the support of his uncle in his career in Parliament as a Whig. He died in 1879 at the age of 91, and his son Francis, having had nine children, decided to enlarge the mansion, as shown in these drawings by extending the wings. The new additions, however, almost bankrupted the family, and in the following decades they rented it out often as a hunting and fishing destination to a number of famous occupants including Herbert Asquith, the Prime Minister of the UK, from 1908 to 1916. Herbert's daughter, Violet Bonham Carter, also stayed here. She was later to become a famous politician whose great-granddaughter is actress Helena Bonham Carter. Another famous occupant was the author and later Governor General of Canada, John Buchan, Baron of Tweedsmere. Many believe Buchan later used the mansion as his inspiration for his novel, Hunting Tower, which was adapted to a silent film in 1928. Eddie Grenfell, a famous debutante and high society hostess who often entertained people such as Winston Churchill, Oscar Wilde, and H.G. Wells, and was a close friend to six prime ministers, also spent time there. The last family owner was John Campbell Kennedy, who died in 1934, and the following year, the mansion was put up for sale and bought by a timber merchant who cut down all the trees. A few years later, it was then requisitioned by the government to house the Langside School for the Deaf and Dumb, which had vacated its own building in Glasgow due to the German bombing raids. The Langside School at the time housed 170 students and closed shortly after in 1947. Finally, a produce merchant bought the estate and after sharing the house with his friends, it became too large to maintain, so the interior furnishings were sold and the house was abandoned. As the decades passed on, the mansion slowly decayed, gaining a local legend attached to its eerie ruins of a ghostly woman in a white dress who threw herself and her baby from the topmost window. With time, new owners came and went and various plans were made for its renovation, including a hotel and golf course in the 1990s and in the 2000s, a plan to make it into a luxury hotel. But none of these came to fruition and today it sits alone, almost forgotten, brooding over its abandoned surroundings. Heading down an overgrown path, the mansion begins to peek darkly over the young trees now growing around it. It has a truly intimidating presence. Spying a way in, we head into the undergrowth. The mossy steps lead to the most beautifully carved wooden doorway I've ever seen, completely entwined with ivy.
From descriptions of the house and Adam's drawings, this circular room would have been the drawing room, a formal living room to impress guests with. Now empty to the sky, the top floor once held a circular library of shelves with a domed, ornate ceiling. Traces of wall mounts and alcoves suggest shields, busts, and crests once adorned these walls. Plaster, lathes, and some paint still clings to the walls here. I gesture down the passage where lies one of the most stunning architectural works Adam was ever to create. The massive, four-storied, cantilevered stairs that once led up to the very top of the mansion. Sadly, in 2014, this wonder collapsed due to the tree roots above weakening the structure and bringing half of it crashing down, with the top part falling on the lower. I'm just glad I wasn't standing on them back then. A carved detail on one step lies broken underfoot. These amazing spiral steps once had an iron handrail running the entire length. Spiraling upwards, they rose dizzyingly. and were lit by a huge skylight above that flooded them with natural light. From the top landing, they led into the circular library with its domed ceiling, visible here in photos from the 1970s. 
Today you'd never know, but that's just part of the tragedy of this place. From the central stairs is what often served as the main entrance. Wood paneling still lines the walls here. Far above, the window sills and frames still hang in midair. Sadly, during the decades of decay, much of the wood from the house was removed in a huge pile and left to rot, though some of its amazing plaster work was captured on film. From the shelf above and the hole in the wall, this tower alcove seems to have housed a bathroom, possibly on each floor. Across the room is a spiral staircase that seems intact. We're going to try to head up and get another view of the mansion. The steps are just kind of dark. Mm -hmm. 
I don't see a sign. Yeah, it goes down to, I don't know. Yeah. Oh, is that what that is? Oh, it goes all the way up. There's no even metals growing up there. Their name into the phone, so. mm -hmm. Please do not come up here with me. Do not come up here with me. Because I don't trust it in the way. Yeah. 
In a small elevator shaft, the metal wheel still hangs in place, and strangely, a stair runs alongside it. The metal beams above show just how massive the structure's skeleton once was. The spiral stairs also lead downwards, and at their bottom is a spike of sharp, broken railing. It goes to like that wall. So you're like between the wall and the building. No, no, there's just a fence. There's a well here that I went on home. This turret seems to have been used for storage, possibly of wine. The fence has fallen, and beyond it is a sunken route running under the stairs and along the servant's floor, allowing access to the side courtyard. There's on both sides. I haven't even been through the whole main building yet. That probably was up against that door, so it just got pushed. We head into the massive, pitch black basements, but luckily we have some better lighting ready.
The understructure is incredibly solid with arched ceilings running the length of the original unextended house. These rooms would have housed the workers and their workplaces out of sight of the mansion's owners who would have summoned them with a bell system. This Victorian stone basin seems to have been part of a washroom. The room here is full of the rusted remnants of a working kitchen. The large window to its side probably was for servants handing trays of food to staff running it to a dumbwaiter or the elevator. Many of the rooms are quite large, rivaling forts that I've seen. Their purpose, though, is a mystery.
At the end of the hall are the remnants of a bathroom. Somewhere hidden in the jungle at the end of the basement hall are walls and gateposts that once attached to the dairy and other buildings. There are some noises above, and we briefly stop to listen. It turns out to be nothing. It's hard to say whether these brick openings were wine shelves or brick ovens due to their decayed state.
fallen gear is all that's left of this elevator, but the shaft stretches far above, still mostly intact. The basement exits here, denoting the end of the original mansion and the start of the 1880s add-on. The architecture is different, with large bay windows projecting outwards. More rudimentary but better preserved fireplaces also dot this area. We start to pack up to head out the main entrance, but we aren't done yet because the true marvel of this place is from above. Heading down the steps, the view of the main Adam designed courtyard and mansion front is truly a sight to behold. Let's view it from above. It's truly breathtaking in appearance, but also in the sheer architectural and cultural loss that it represents. The mansion's sister castle, once home to the hated Earl, is celebrated as one of Scotland's architectural masterpieces and appears on the Bank of Scotland's five-pound note, while Adam's other lost masterwork lies in ruin.
While we may never know Thomas's true intentions for building it, his great dream, meant to last the ages as a symbol of triumph, now stands empty. Its purpose, whether a tale of keeping up with the Joneses or of pure spite, is a long-lost memory. Its halls, now silent, no longer alive with voices or a home to anything except for the winds. Perhaps there's a message for all of us in this place as to the fleeting importance of the competition for material wealth. The squandered years spent imitating another's actions, a life wasted while absorbed in another's success and dreams. With the mansion now up for sale for a million dollars, nobody knows what the future may hold for this beautifully decaying house, but I'm glad to have been able to share its story with you today, before it too, one day, is just a memory. Until next time. If you enjoyed today's video, click here for more abandoned places in Scotland and their lost stories. Or click here for part one of the Bloody Kennedy Clan feud and their abandoned castle.